Tom, first of all, you must be chuffed with the documentary, a fine piece of work. Yeah, look, I, I had limited involvement in it, very limited. Uh, it's all Tom Boswell and his team, uh, the responsible for it. Uh, I think they've done a brilliant job. You know, a great, great job. They've brought it to life. I, was, I wrote the book in 2010. The book and the film are very kind of very different projects, different ways of, of doing it. But I think they've done a yeah. I was, it's it was it was just I would say quite emotional for an Irish guy watching Scotland beat England in a Grand Slam. I was I was still quite emotional watching it. Take us back to where you were on the 17th of March 1990. I'd hazard a guess you'd be in London. I was. At the time. I was, I was in London, uh, I'd left college, uh, I was working on building sites, um, I took the day off work to watch the game in a house with about nine guys from Limerick, uh, <laughs> I think it was about a three bedroom house, there was at least nine, maybe ten of us living there, and we all watched the game, we all watched the game, and we've all got vivid memories of it even though we were all all Irish because we wanted Scotland to win you know <laughs> just, just for Scotland but also to give England a kind of bloody nose that's the way we were thinking back then um, and it was amazing you know and I think the mayhem of the game it only increases over time when you see the desperation in the Scotland defence the will to win they're, they're kind of incredibly steadfast refusal to let England through in the last plays. That was amazing. Now, it's clearly left a lasting impression on you because mm. you obviously then sit down to chart the, the whole history of, of that campaign for both England and Scotland mm. culminating in, in the match. But the immediate aftermath, was it a game that you returned to in your thoughts or did you just put it to the back of your mind for I, some time? I, I put it to the back of my mind for, I don't know, for a good, for a good 10 years maybe. And then I started to come back up and I used to see magazine pieces or newspaper pieces referring back to it and the political dimension to it. And I was thinking around 2005, 2006, I thought I wanted to write a book, but I didn't want to write a sports book. I wanted to write something with, which had more to it. Um, and I thought of this game. I'm living in Scotland at the time. I'd moved uh, over from Ireland at that point. Um, my wife is Scottish. I said it to her and she says, oh, she's not a rugby fan at all. Hasn't a clue about rugby, but she remembers this game, you know? Uh, and she remembers where she was and how she felt. So I thought, you know, this, if, if, if this game resonates with my wife who's no interest in rugby, then there's something here. And then you look at the two sets of players and one character after another, after another, after another. So around 2008, I thought, yeah, I want to write this book, and I finished it in 2009. It came out in 2010. The characters then in your book, the players that mm. you spoke to, and then the, the characters that appear on the film mm. in the documentary, there's a fine balance to it in mm. terms of how England are represented, how the Scots are represented, and there's a clarity and a tremendous honesty about sort of each and every insert in both the book and in the... TV yeah, and like you, you needed to get, um, and I think the film gets it, uh, it, that sense that these were rugby men, but they were people. They had lives, they had come from somewhere, and they were interesting. They're backstories. That's what I keep trying to dig into about Telfer's life, about McGeekin's life, Brian Moore and Will Carling on the other side of it. Um, these are deep people, you know? Um, and you talk to you talk to Geach about his father and becomes very emotional. You talk to Jim Telfer about his mother and father, he becomes very intense, even more intense than Jim, Jim normally is. Although Jim as a rugby coach and Jim as a human being are very different creatures. Um, and you talk to Carling and you talk to Moore, you're just getting incredible honesty from, from Will Carling in the book. Brutal honesty about himself, same with Brian. Um, it's just, I mean, I would be some kind of idiot to mess this book up, given the cast of characters and the honesty and the time that they gave me. Um, I'll be always grateful because the book, has, the book has been brilliant for me. I've had great fun out of it. And I owe it all to the players and the coaches who, who spent so much time and listened to my stupid questions all the time. Just a couple of points to finish with. One, 
again going back to, to the book, is something you touched on was a conversation, a very brief conversation on the pitch, on the day of the, the match between Scotland and England, between Ian McGeechan and the pipe major mm, of yeah. the, the band playing on, on the pitch. And again, that touching on the, the emotion of Ian McGeechan when his father is mentioned. Yeah, that was, that was kind of eerie. Um, so Geech said that to me, um, that as he was walking around the pitch before the match, <clears throat> the pipe major um, uh, comes over to him and says, uh, I just want to say that I went to school with your father in, in Dunblane um, and that he would be very proud today. And Geech was telling that story again, very emotional and telling it, you could understand why. He worships his father. And he felt that somehow, and he doesn't believe in the kind of, you know, the spirit world or whatever you might want to call it, but he's always wanted to believe that that was a message from his father that he was watching, that he was with him in some sense. This man appearing out of the blue saying, I went to school with your father and he's very proud. He said that was, he says that was a moment that he will never forget. Yeah, very powerful and evocative and something else that, just to finish with, that I, I found sort of very powerful and, and, you know, very carefully selected and nurtured through the film was the, the cinematography mm. and the choice of, of the cutaways and the archive footage. That certainly adds a, an awful lot to the production of the documentary. Oh, massively. I mean, when you see the, when you see the scene when, when Jim Telfer appears in, in the film first, uh, the aerial shots over Melrose, just beautiful. Just beautiful, um, uh, JJ in the borders on the farm. Uh, just re it just adds so much to it that a book can't. You know, we can't. We have pictures, but it's just normal headshots in the book. Here, you get the whole span of the Scot, the beautiful Scottish landscape, um, and you can see the people. You know, you can see Jim's intensity. You can see Geech's emotion. Um, and I thought that was very powerful, and they they selected very well. Tom, uh, he selected very well, beautifully shot, and I'm very proud to have just a teeny weeny bit of involvement with her. Alex Salmon, thank you very much for taking the time to speak to us. Your first impressions then on the documentary, The Grudge. Oh, it's a, a great film. I, I would <laughs> I, I would recommend that uh, every Scottish sporting team. In fact, every Scottish politician should be shown it at regular intervals just to remind them what it's all about. It's an absolute grand. I mean, you know, there's lots of great sporting films about great sporting achievements, and there's lots of programmes on politics, but the interesting thing was merging the, the Grand Slam in 1990 against the backcloth of the day, the poll tax, that's and all the rest of it. That's an amazing thing to do. First class, well done. Can you recall where you were when the, the events were unfolding at Murrayfield that afternoon? Absolutely, I was in Lilivgo, my nose up against the television because I couldn't get a ticket. Now, you, you, we've got background. I, I'd been at most of the Scotland games and because I, I worked for the Royal Bank and were the sponsors. And then I became an MP, so you got invited. But I couldn't get a, a, a ticket for that guy. I mean, they were going for thousands of pounds. And so I was had my nose up against the television. The interesting thing, there's something John Jeffrey says in, in the film. He says, look, this was the first time that rugby became to be the sport of Scotland. There was folk turning up who'd never been near a rugby game before because cause the football internationals between Scotland and England had been stopped. Uh, and rugby became a, a sport of the masses. <clears throat> was all the better for it and that was a that was a team for the ages and of course both the the rugby union internationals that <clears throat> immediately preceded the one in 1990 and the football matches as well were close affairs yeah. there were no runaway successes for either team so that always made it a very intriguing coming together of these two forces yes and and as they pointed out in the film I mean this was the first year where God Save the Queen was supplanted by Flower of Scotland. <laughs> and you know, I mean, the, and the, the atmosphere that generated, the, the sort of bringing together of the, the team and the nation, I mean, that was worth a, a couple of extra men, I think. As a sporting moment, as a collective sporting moment, where does it rank, in, in your opinion, in terms of Scotland team achievements, let's say, over the last 50, 60 years or so? Oh, it's right up there. I mean, I, this is... Uh, 
I think it's the moment where uh, rugby union became a, a national sport in Scotland, a stretch. I mean, obviously, it had always been a sport for everyone in the borders. But that's obvious, a working-class sport in the borders. But you had a, a team at its heart, had some uh, hard men from the, uh, from the debatable lands. Uh, and that <laughs> gave it some of the, the spirit that carried it through. But this is when it became a national sport for, for all of Scotland. So... It's right up there, and, and the film does it justice. It shows the context of the times, it shows the achievement of the team. And listen, some of these guys have worn quite well, you know. <laughs> they have indeed, well, one, one or two, I was uh, almost uh, astounded at how well they've, uh, they, they have aged. But as you say, the, the, taking it away from just the, the rugby match itself, which is obviously mm. very much at the heart of the film, it's, it's a, a perfect illustration of the, the social history at the time. That's right. I mean, look, they, uh, this was an incredibly talented uh, England team. Uh, but like it or not, and I don't suppose they did like it, but, you know, Will Carling, Jeremy Guscott, uh, but, uh, Rob Andrews, they, they kind of represented everything that Scotland was bridling against. And if you, you put them up against the, you know, the Armstrongs, the Chalmers, the, the Jeffrey, you know, if, if you're going into a battle, I know what side I don't want to be on. Now we're going to finish with uh, maybe a slight curveball. Uh, we'll move to football because I know you're a, a big football man, big Hearts supporter. Did the fact that Hearts lost to Aberdeen in the, the quarterfinals of the Scottish Cup, Aberdeen eventually going on to win that year, did that take the edge off the day for you slightly? No, that, that game never happened. I've blanked that totally out of my consciousness. But something very important happened that day. The result, the, 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 actually the, the score, the updated score, from Murrayfield was being broadcast at Scottish football games. And not just at half time, as Scotland were winning, they were broadcasting and everywhere. I've been mean, presumably at Petodre, but Tannadice, where I were playing, all over the place. People were <laughs> cheering on a rugby match in the middle of the football games. That's quite significant. That that indicates it was uh, rugby union's coming of age as a, a true national sport in Scotland. Gavin, thank you very much for your time. Uh, the grudge must be a very pleasant trip down memory lane for you. Indeed, and, and I have to say I thoroughly enjoyed the film. It was, uh, it was full of a lot of humour, I thought, and uh, beautifully uh, presented and produced. And, and um, you know, I think it, it, in the build-up to the game, it showed a lot of, um, you know, England's wonderful play uh, during that Five Nations. And, and obviously... Um, Scotland kind of, we muddled through a couple of games, you know, particularly the away matches against uh, against Ireland and, and Wales. And, um, you know, we had a fairly easy victory against um, France at home at Murrayfield. But, of course, the film is all about the, the final game. And, uh, you know, it, it I suppose it was the making of many of us that, that were lucky enough to play to have played in that game. I suppose that evening, the immediate aftermath of the success, you'd be told about the enormity of, of this success and, and what it would do in terms of a lasting legacy. But I guess you'd never expect to be standing here 32, 33 years later, mulling over such a, a victory. Uh, indeed not. And, and yet I'm very, very pleased that it's, you know, there's, there's a very worthwhile film that is behind that now. And, and you know, grandkids maybe in the future can... Uh, can can hopefully enjoy that and say there's a grandfather having uh, having played and taken part in in that game as well as the film and um, but you know in a way you look back now and and thirty odd years later um, you wish there was an updated version that we could draw upon as well and that's it's slightly sad in a way um, albeit that I'm that I'm pleased that that we've been here today to to witness it. You'll never tire in watching your own role in the Tony Stanger try, of course. Your, your, your kick for him to then chase and, and score. You know, it's just, it's funny. You play for your country for 10 years and uh, there are moments that stand out and that are just a fleeting few seconds. And, and clearly that is, is one such moment. And, uh, you know, interestingly, the, the, what led to that, that score was me kicking the ball out at the start of the second half, straight out in the full. I didn't want to the, mention the scrum, that. I'll mention it. The scrum came back, Mike Teague knocked it on, we got the put in, and uh, we scored straight from that as, in a sort of strike move that we love from, from a scrum right in the middle of the field that we'd practised over many, many training sessions. So, And that came to fruition that day 
to enable Scotland to win the, the, the Grand Slam. And, uh, you know, so you've always got to think of the positive, even when I, um, when I put the ball out in the full at the start of the second half. Um, you know, two minutes later, we're, we're getting a try that wins us the Grand Slam. And great to have the, the blend of characters that coached you, that managed you, making such a contribution in the documentary as well, you to know, hear from them. Absolutely, and, and you know, Geach and, and Jim will go down in, in history as the greatest Scottish coaches, and deservedly so, and, um, you know, they were characters, and, and poor Derek White in that film, my goodness, I didn't realise it's affected him quite as much as it clearly did. And I think I'll give him a wee text tonight and say, are you OK, Derek? You know, let me buy you a beer when you're next up. And uh, my goodness me, because, I mean, Jim was a hard taskmaster. And fortunately, um, myself and, and the rest of the backs, we stayed away from Jim as, as much as possible. And even now, he's kind of scary Jim, you know. Keach was altogether a much more uh, friendly figure. A bit of counselling for, for Derek White. <laughs> just, just, just to finish on terms of the, the, the film before I go and ask you one other uh, supplementary question. Uh, am I right in saying that on the morning of the game you were at Murrayfield, you launched a, just a, a, a speculative a punt, a, a punt forward yeah, yeah. and it happened it to landed straight. It landed straight in Craig Chalmers' head, knocked him over. He went flying to the ground. I was 50 yards away and I said, oh my God, is Craig going to be out? And he <laughs> literally fell over. This ball hit him full of bounce and, uh, you know, I ran over to me, all right? And there was nothing much to hurt there for Craig Chalmers. So he was okay and he obviously kicked his goals in the game and played very, very well as he had the whole season. So, you know, I think he's forgiven me for that now. Had no lasting impact, let's hope anyway. But uh, <laughs> moving on to the Battle of the Hastings then. Tell us a, a little bit about uh, this coming together of your, yourself and Scott in Edinburgh up in Perth. It's, it's going to be a, a fascinating evening. I hope so. And, uh, you know, Scott and I have, you know, we've we're, we got on great and we're very, very close. I speak to Scott most days and, uh, you know, and... Um, He's a character, Scott. We we know that, and and you know we've we've um, we've been pals for a long, long time, and and so we haven't really talked so much about this uh, battle of Hastings, and uh, I'm sure there'll be a lot of stories that will come out on on the evenings themselves. But uh, we'll look forward to it, and I, I think there'll be a lot of fun, and a lot of humour, and. Uh, um, as long as people don't repeat what is said in the theatres, then that will be the most important thing. But we look forward to that and hopefully we can provide an, an entertaining evening for everyone who attends. Well, if it's un unscripted and uh, just impromptu, then it Aye. makes it that bit more interesting. Well, I think that's what we would like to do. <laughs>